Have you ever stopped to think about why some rivers have a different color? For example, right now on your screen, you can see the exact moment when two rivers from different sources meet. But what does that actually mean? What's the connection between watercolor and precious stones? You might have noticed rivers in your area that look a bit off. Some of them might have a strange blue-green tint. Others might look orange or rusty, sometimes with muddy patches, or even a layer that looks like iron, and most people don't even notice. They just walk by thinking it's just part of the landscape. But what if I told you that this little detail could actually be one of the most valuable clues for finding precious stones in nature? Here's the thing. Gemstones are valuable because they're hard to find. The rarer the gem, the more it tends to be worth. And if you want to find something truly valuable out in nature, you have to pay attention to the details. It's not impossible, but you need to know how to read the signs nature gives you. That's why so many opportunities are missed by many people. They don't know that the color of the water can reveal secrets hidden underground. And this isn't just a theory. Scientific studies confirm that minerals dissolved in water can completely change its color. And some of those minerals are directly connected to the presence of rare gems like rubies and even diamonds. So the next time you see a creek with a strange color, instead of ignoring it, take a closer look. In many cases, that water didn't just change color by accident. It changed because of the concentration of minerals in the soil, in the rocks, and in the metals that act as mineral indicators. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you in today's video. How to interpret these unusual watercolors and what kinds of precious stones they could be pointing to. Of course, these signs are not guaranteed, but trust me, there are still a lot of precious stones out there just waiting for the right person to find them. And the confirmation might be right in front of you, flowing silently through a colorful stream. Every experienced prospector knows this. And to make things simple, the first step to understanding why water changes color in certain places is to look a little deeper. The water that flows through a river, a stream, or even a natural spring is never alone. It carries everything it touches along the way. Soil particles, organic debris, sediments, minerals, and in some cases, even rare gemstones. In natural environments, watercolor usually has a reason. And most of the time, that reason is the presence of specific chemical elements that dissolve into the water or mix with it somehow. One of the easiest examples to recognize is iron. When there's a high concentration of iron in the soil or surrounding rocks, and it comes into contact with oxygen and water, it oxidizes. Basically, it rusts, and the result is that orange or reddish tone we often see in creeks, especially in mountainous areas or near old mines. Another common element that changes the color of water is copper. In regions where copper deposits or exposed veins are present, the water can take on a greenish tone or even a turquoise blue, depending on the concentration. That happens because copper-based minerals like malachite and chrysocolla release tiny metal particles that partially dissolve in the water, changing how it looks. And this kind of color isn't just pretty to look at. It's often a strong sign that valuable minerals could be nearby, especially in areas with copper-rich formations. Manganese is another mineral that leaves a mark wherever it goes. It can make water look darker, shifting it toward purple, brown, or even black when present in higher concentrations. In areas with manganese-rich soil, this is especially noticeable in natural springs or small waterfalls where the flow is steady and oxidation happens naturally. There's also sulfur, which is well known for its strong visual and sensory effects. Sulfur can give the water a milky or whitish appearance and sometimes a very distinctive smell. Some people say it smells like rotten eggs. These sulfur-rich waters usually appear in volcanic zones or near hot springs, where dissolved gases and sulfur compounds reach the surface. It's not a very common environment, so you probably won't find a place like this in your area. But even if it seems like a harsh or strange place, the presence of sulfur could mean you're near a geothermal zone deep underground, where some types of gemstones can also form. Besides that, there are other factors like fine clay particles and organic sediments that can also change the water's appearance, making it murky or milky. So it's important to remember that polluted rivers shouldn't be considered in this kind of analysis. 
But how can you tell the difference between water that's cloudy because of mud or pollution and water that's rich in natural minerals? Even though it sounds tricky, there's actually a subtle difference. Water colored by minerals tends to be more stable and consistent along the river's path. But when the color comes from organic matter like rotting leaves, seasonal plant debris, or pollution, it often looks patchy and varies depending on rainfall, vegetation, and the time of year. If you spend time fishing in rivers, this will probably be easier for you to notice. But the key point here is simple. When the water changes color, it's not random. The chemistry behind the interaction between water and nearby minerals is what builds this whole scene. And behind that chemistry, there's a whole layer of geology at work. The breaking down of rocks, the exposure of metal veins, and the slow movement of sediments over time all shape what we see on the surface. And if you can learn to read these signs, you'll always be one step ahead in the search for gemstones. Because now it's time to understand which gems are associated with each type of water. Here's a valuable tip. Watercolor is easier to notice in places where the flow is steady and the riverbed is light-colored, like areas with gravel, quartzite, or smooth bedrock. In these conditions, even a slight change in color can be seen with the naked eye, especially when sunlight hits the surface. Now that you understand why water changes color in certain regions, it's time for the part that really matters. Figuring out which gemstones might be found in the rivers near you based on the exact color of the water. Let's start with the easiest color to recognize, orange or rusty red. If you see a stream with this kind of color, especially with that rusty crust forming on the rocks, you can be sure there's iron in the soil. And where there's iron, there could be garnet. This small red stone can appear in grain form in some regions. If you find garnet in a stream, along with fragments of ilmenite and chromite, your chances of finding diamonds go up significantly. In places like North Carolina and Colorado, prospectors have found high-quality garnets by following this exact clue. Some of them, like the one you see on the screen now, can be cut into beautiful gems just like this. Iron can also show up alongside minerals that point to sapphire, usually in shades of blue, especially in aluminum-rich metamorphic rocks like gneiss. It's not a guarantee, but the chances are much better. Now when the water is green or blue-green, things get even more exciting. That's because copper doesn't just form beautiful minerals like malachite, chrysocala, and azurite. It's also connected to valuable gems like green tourmaline and paraba tourmaline, blue Vesuvianite, turquoise, and even opals in some regions with high copper content. These are often found in pegmatites or hydrothermal zones. In rare cases, even imperial topaz has been discovered in areas where the water had a bluish tint and the soil showed signs of copper. When the water is dark, almost black or grayish, this might indicate manganese or even decomposing organic matter. If it's manganese, the area could be a great place to search for black spinel, magnetite, hematite, and in some cases, dark tone jade. These types of gems usually form in high pressure environments like ancient subduction zones or deep metamorphic terrains. If the water looks milky, cloudy, or white, that might be due to clays, kaolin, or dissolved mineral salts. A lot of people ignore places like this, but that's a mistake. Milky water can signal geothermal activity or hydrothermal alteration in the rocks. And that could point to opals, colorless beryl, or even zircon. In states like Nevada and Utah, this type of setting has revealed deposits of black opal and natural zircon with high market value. Here's an important detail. It's the combination of watercolor and the surrounding rock types that really completes the puzzle. For example, bluish water by itself doesn't mean much. But if that water is flowing over a rocky bed with quartz veins, feldspar, or mica, then you might be looking at a pegmatite environment. And that's exactly where gems like tourmaline, emerald, topaz, and even diamonds can occur. They may not all form under the same processes, but they can be present under the same conditions. In other words, watercolor alone doesn't prove anything. It's just one of the clues. Think of this like a criminal investigation. You're the detective, the indicators are the evidence, and the gemstones are the hidden suspects. If you gather the right clues, you'll eventually track down the gems that are hiding in your region. And the best way to increase your odds is by combining watercolor with known mineral indicators. 
In some cases, it was exactly this combination of watercolor and mineral indicators that led to truly surprising discoveries. One of the best known examples comes from the state of Colorado. In certain mountainous regions there, riverbeds show a strong reddish tint, especially near old abandoned mines. For years, no one paid attention to those rust-colored streams until some researchers started noticing a pattern. Around those oxidized waters, fragments of garnet, ilmenite, and chromite were showing up in the gravel. And it didn't take long for some more observant prospectors to start finding microscopic diamonds in the sediment, a clear sign that the area had kimberlite potential. In that case, the first clue was the color of the water. Then came the minerals. And finally, the diamond fragments. This story reveals one of the most important truths about gemstone prospecting in rivers. The most valuable crystals are not always visible at first glance, but the fragments of rocks and minerals carried by the current work like a map. That's why experienced prospectors don't look for gemstones directly. First, they search for the signs. Without them, it's nearly impossible to assess a region's real potential. For example, if you find garnet, chromite, and ilmenite in an alluvial deposit, especially if those minerals are found alongside kimberlite or lamproite fragments, that classic combination strongly suggests that diamonds could be nearby. Even if you don't see the diamonds yet, the presence of heavy indicator minerals alone says a lot about the kind of host rock that lies upstream. In other situations, the rock fragments exposed on the riverbanks provide important information. For example, if you find alluvial deposits with granite chunks showing a pegmatitic structure, those white veins made of quartz, feldspar, and mica, your chances of finding tourmaline, aquamarine, emeralds, topaz, zircon, or spinal increase significantly. That's because pegmatites are rocks formed during the final stages of magma crystallization. That's when the rarest elements concentrate. And it's exactly in these environments that many of the world's finest gemstones are born. Another promising scenario is when fragments of schist and gneiss are mixed into the river gravel. These deep metamorphic rocks are linked to the formation of rubies, sapphires, and spinels. In regions like Montana, North Carolina, and parts of California, this type of geology has already revealed gemstones of extremely high value. Sometimes just spotting rounded red garnets in the sediment is enough to raise a flag. And if you also find minerals like kyanite, storolite, or even raw corundum, you could be a lot closer to a ruby or sapphire than you realize. The same logic applies to areas with ancient hydrothermal activity, where quartz veins cut through altered volcanic rocks. In places like central Nevada or parts of Utah, you'll often find fragments of silica, iron oxides, and small opaque nodules. These indicate zones with potential for opal, zircon, topaz, and even chrysobril. All of this material is carried by streams that, at first glance, may seem completely insignificant. Take Arizona, for example, in the Morenci region. There, some creeks show an intense green color caused by copper that naturally dissolves from surrounding rocks. In those areas, veins of malachite and chrysocolla literally emerge from the ground. And it's not uncommon to find turquoise fragments washed to the riverbanks, along with small crystals of Vesuvianite, tourmaline, and even colorful opals. These creeks have become a source of income for those who figured out what was hiding beneath their feet. Back in Nevada, like we mentioned before, milky or whitish creeks are often caused by colloidal silica, sometimes mistaken for pollution. But to those who understand altered volcanic terrain and geothermal activity, that milky color is a clear signal. It was exactly this kind of environment that led to the discovery of the region's famous black opals. In certain areas, it's still possible to find amorphous silica fragments, opal nodules, and even tiny natural zircon crystals in small cavities. And there's more. In Virginia, amateur rockhounds have reported finding garnets, spinels, and even small samples of kyanite in creeks that appear totally ordinary. In Maine, lithium-rich pegmatites are associated with colorful tourmalines and barrels, including rare types like morganite and goshenite. All of these materials get carried by water to the gravel beds along riverbanks. And the pattern repeats itself in other states with similar geological formations, like New Mexico, Georgia, California, North Carolina, and even places around the world. Which means these principles can be applied anywhere, as long as you understand that each region has its own geological identity with different rocks, minerals, and gemstone types.
The point is simple. What the average person sees as regular gravel, someone with geological knowledge sees as a trail of clues. Every rock fragment and every heavy dark mineral at the bottom of your pan might be telling a story about what's hidden nearby. You don't need to find the gem right away. Most of the time, you'll find the signs first. The same signs geologists and prospectors have been following for centuries. So after going through this whole adventure in nature, let's imagine you found a crystal clear gemstone, something that looks like what's showing on your screen right now. How would you know what it is? Could it be a diamond, a topaz, maybe quartz, or even zircon? Let's say you want to find out if this shiny stone is a diamond. The first test, and one of the easiest, is to use an ultraviolet light. Some diamonds, especially natural ones, glow with a soft blue fluorescence when exposed to UV. But be careful. Not all diamonds show this reaction, so you can't rely on that alone. That's where the Mohs scale comes in. It's used around the world to measure the hardness of minerals. The scale goes from 1 to 10. The higher the number, the harder the material. For example, quartz has a hardness of 7, while regular glass has around 5. So if you rub quartz against glass, the glass will get scratched, but the quartz won't. Diamonds sit at the very top of the scale with a hardness of 10. So in theory, you'd need something with a hardness of 9 to test it properly, like a ruby, for example. But does that mean you need to go out and buy a real ruby just to run a test? Not at all. There's a much cheaper option. You can use a sandpaper made with carborundum, also known as industrial ruby. If you rub your stone against that sandpaper and it starts wearing down, then unfortunately it's not a diamond. But if it stays completely intact, there's a good chance you're holding something very special. But even if your gemstone doesn't pass the test, the last thing you should do is throw it away. That's because many precious stones look very simple in their raw state. Quartz, for example, is easy to find and might not be worth much, but it can still have value, especially if it's pure, well-formed, or has a rare color. And the same goes for topaz, beryl, spinal, and so many other gemstones that can appear where you least expect them. Still, we know there are hundreds of types of gemstones. Some are completely unique. Others look almost identical. Trying to explain all of them in a single video would take hours. That's exactly why before you rush out to your nearest river, there's one last thing you really need to know. A lot of people out there have actually found valuable stones, but because they didn't know how to properly identify the mineral type or the quality of the gem, they ended up getting scammed and selling for way below market price. And unfortunately, there are buyers who take advantage of that lack of knowledge to pay pennies for stones that are worth a lot more. That's exactly why I created the ebook Gemology Journey for Beginners. It's a complete no-nonsense guide for anyone who wants to learn how to identify minerals in a simple and practical way. In the ebook, you'll learn how to test hardness, density, luster, transparency, and even recognize indicator minerals, all with methods you can do at home, even without professional equipment. With this knowledge, you'll feel more confident knowing exactly what you're holding before showing it to any buyer. It protects you from getting ripped off and gives you the chance to build a proper collection or even hold on to a gem as a long-term investment. And here's the big news. On the 25th of next month, we're launching the print version of the book with a physical cover and brand new gemology techniques. It's perfect for those who like to highlight pages, take notes, or keep a field reference on hand. And the digital version will also get a free upgrade at no extra cost for anyone who already owns the earlier edition. If you want to take things even further, you can also join our channel's members area. You'll get early access to videos, exclusive content with maps, identification charts, and all of that is available for a small monthly fee. But if you're just starting out or feel like now's not the right time to invest, that's totally fine. You can subscribe to the channel for free and keep learning from our videos, including the next one that's already showing up on your screen. It'll teach you how to identify gems that may look common but are hiding real treasures inside. Thanks for liking and subscribing. Good luck, Gem Hunter.